Hey, how's it going everyone? Welcome back to Keeping Fish Simple. So in today's video, we're gonna be talking about Infusoria and I haven't made a video on this in my channel before, but I've talked about this concept heaps and I've just been getting hounded with comments and people asking me on how I make Infusoria. So in today's video, we're gonna be talking about exactly how I make Infusoria. I'm gonna be giving you guys two different methods. There's gonna be one method that works really, really quickly. That's super easy to do. So if you have some emergency fry, like some little Danios that need Infusoria or some Garamis or something like that that need Infusoria, you're gonna be able to get that really quickly. The other method that I have is just a really long-term easy method of creating Infusoria, which I like to use. So for all those people who are wondering what Infusoria is, Infusoria is just these tiny little protozoans, I think they are. I could be wrong on that. They're smaller than any kind of branch that you can get on the market. And the reason a lot of people like to use Infusoria is because there's lots of fry in this aquarium hobby that when they're first born, their mouths might be too small to take baby branch room. So you have to feed them some kind of other food that will allow them to grow and then move on to baby branch because their mouths might just be too small to eat that baby branch room. So in those instances, I love to use Infusoria. A lot of people will use powdered foods and little things like that, and that can work great. The only problem with that is that it's not a live food, and the fish isn't gonna have a natural instinct to go to that food unless it sees it moving some sort of way. So Infusoria is by far the best thing to use for any kind of breeding of fish that have really small mouths. So I like to use this for my rainbow fish. I like to use it for my celestial pearl danio fry, which I'm gonna show you guys me feeding some of my infusoria to those guys. I love to use it for neon tetra babies. It's also really good for bedders and things like that. So without any further ado, let's get started on the first method which is really, really, really easy. Okay, so we've just come over to my storage room where we're gonna set this up and we're just setting it up on top of a fridge so it's a little bit gross and grotty in here, but that's all good. This is just an area for culturing live foods, but what we're gonna need for this method is a jar. So you can just use any kind of jar. This is just a, I think, four liter jar. You definitely don't need four liters. You can do it in a little jar. If you do it in a bigger jar, you'll have more to feed though. So that's why I prefer to use these bigger jars. I've used little ones before and they'll work absolutely fine. You can see we filled it up here with water. Now I like to use tank water, preferably I like to use tank water from like a tank where I don't think the fish have eaten all the infusoria that might be in that water, but that's okay. But some aged aquarium water is perfect. Then we're gonna need some yeast to feed these guys. And the last thing we're gonna need is just a bit of old sponge filter or some kind of media. And what we're gonna do to set this up is first off, there's water going everywhere. We're gonna squeeze this sponge filter and you can see all that gunk coming out of it. We're gonna squeeze that just a little bit into our water so you can see that we've gotten some of that mole out from in there. That's the first step. And then the second thing we're gonna do is we're just gonna add some yeast. So you can see this is just instant dried yeast, nothing expensive here, this is like four bucks from your local grocery store. And what I like to do is I'll feed about, for a jar that big, I'll feed about this much. You can see they're like not a crazy amount you'd rather underfeed than overfeed. I'm adding this to this little jar here. And what I'm doing here is I'm just mixing it up. You don't need to do this, but I prefer to do this just to get it into a liquid form. And I'm just gonna add this to our jar. And you just wanna create like a milky mix in this jar. And the reason we're adding the yeast is because the yeast is gonna be our food for those infusorias. So what's in this jar? is a bunch of little infusoria swimming around. And the yeast is gonna act as like the bacteria that they're gonna eat. And the infusoria are gonna predate on the yeast and they're gonna use that to multiply, multiply, multiply. What's gonna happen is once this is all clear, there'll be a ton of infusoria in here. And this is just a really easy way to culture the infusoria quickly. Now, a lot of people like to use methods like using a boiled piece of broccoli and letting it rot with some java moss and things like that, which I have done. But personally, I'm just not a fan of that. It takes a couple of days for that to rot. It really stinks and it doesn't work too well unless you do it like in a big container, which I don't have. So I like to use this. And the other thing too with using this is it cultures so much quicker. Like we're gonna have infusoria in here that we can feed to our fry within 48 hours, which is absolutely awesome. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take this back to the fish room so we can keep it at a nice warm temperature because a lot of people will say you need infusoria at a cool temperature. I've personally found at about 25 to 28 degrees Celsius, it grows super quick. So now that we've finished setting this up, let's take it back to the fish room and we'll see how it goes over the next couple of days. Okay, so while we wait for our first culture to mature, let's take a look at this other method of culturing infusoria that I like to do. So in this bucket, you can see we have some water and we also have a ton of java moss. Now, this method is super, super simple. Basically, all you need to do is get yourself a small bucket like this with a lid. You definitely need a lid. And what you're gonna do is chuck a bunch of java moss into a tub like this, close it for a week, leave it in there, and then open it up after a week and you'll see that there's just gonna be a ton of infusoria in here. Now, this is actually a self-sustaining infusoria culture. All I do for this culture is refill it with water whenever I've used up some water. So every time I take a cup of infusoria out, 
I then refill it with some fresh water. That way the infusoria culture never dies. And I can just continue to harvest from this every day. I've been using this culture every day for at least three months now. And it's raised up so many fry. I can't even tell you how many fry this culture's raised up. So I know it seems like the simplest method ever, but it literally is. It works super, super well. All you need to do is get a bucket with some java moss, throw a ton of java moss in there. You can see I've got quite a large amount. You can see I've just stirred up a bunch of that infusoria. It really stinks. Leave it for a week in the dark like this. Like just leave the lid on there and then come back after a week, open it up and you'll have a thriving culture of infusoria. So that's the second method and that's the method that I like to use now. So, okay, so I've just taken a cup of our mixture that I was showing you before, just so you can see what this mixture looks like with the infusoria in it. So this is a really close up look with one of my macro lenses. And you can see here all these little dots inside of the water, which are the infusoria. So that's what the fish eats. When we go back further, you can see here, it just looks like a cloudy mixture. So that's what your infusoria is gonna look like. It's gonna be really hard for me to explain to you what exactly you're looking for until you actually see it in real life. It's very, very obvious when you see it. You'll see like there's gonna be streamers of these guys coming down. You'll be able to like shake the top and you'll see all those little infusorias fall down because they're really attracted to the light. But yeah, I'll flash up some videos of what it looks like that I can find around on the internet because that's probably gonna be the best judgment. So I guess now that you guys understand what infusoria looks like, let's go take it over to a tub with some freshly hatched celestial pearl danios and give them a feed. So these here are some young celestial pearl danios down on the bottom of the screen. So right down here, this would be a young celestial pearl danio and this guy is only hatched today. So he's very, very tiny and you can see just how small some of these little guys are. And they're definitely not able to eat baby brine shrimp of this size. So this is a great example of a fish that we need to feed infusoria to. So what we're gonna do is basically just take that mixture and we're just gonna go ahead and add it to the aquarium, or I guess this little tub that they're in. And I don't worry about overfeeding this too much because it'll just stay in the water and it won't die because it's a freshwater organism. So if you add a nice decent cup of it, they're gonna spend all day nibbling on it. And it means you don't have to come in and constantly feed these guys. I feed them a cup of infusoria a day and they do absolutely fine. Now, they're gonna live on infusoria for a couple of days until they're finally big enough to eat baby brine shrimp or some powdered food. So this is why infusoria is just an absolutely amazing food for a lot of these little tiny itty bitty fish. So I guess now I'm gonna explain a few other things about infusoria cultures that I used to get stuck on and I wasn't having success with my infusoria previously. And there was a few reasons for that, so I'm gonna explain some of those reasons now. Okay, so about a year and a half ago, I made my first attempt at breeding the neon tetras and I did have some success, but there was a period in time where I was actually struggling quite a bit to get an infusoria culture kit to feed to the fry because part of neon tetras is creating that infusoria kit so that once you've hatched out your eggs, you have something to feed those fry so they don't die because they're very, very tiny fry and they definitely need infusoria. Now, when I was doing this, I was doing it in a little jar and I was having a few issues trying to get an infusoria kit to start. Now, I started up about three or four jars, I think, of this stuff, and I only had one culture work. Now, I think there was one reason why those cultures weren't working, and that was because I was introducing some predators into my infusoria kit. So, those predators might not seem obvious to a lot of people, and I know that a lot of people don't really talk about this in their videos on YouTube about creating infusoria. And these predators are cyclops, and there's a few other ones that eat infusoria in your aquarium. And you can see them with your naked eye, but it's very hard to spot them. I was definitely introducing these guys into my cultures and what would happen is those cyclops would decimate the population of infusoria before it was allowed to really progress and explode. Now, the reason I don't run into these problems nowadays with the cyclops is because, first of all, I do it in a really big volume so it's very hard for the cyclops to hunt down all of the infusoria. And the other thing too with my first method, the 24 hour method, is that I get the infusoria culture on its feet really quickly because I don't have to wait for a little piece of broccoli to decompose before there's bacteria for the infusoria in the aquarium water to eat. So you can see why these two methods have kind of worked a little bit better for me than the previous methods that I had because I'm not running into those issues and I have like probably a 95% success rate with all of my infusoria kits. That's the first thing. The other thing too is getting these guys at the right temperature. Now they're not gonna be fussy at all, but I'd recommend keeping them anywhere from about 22 to 26 degrees Celsius. I don't keep them too hot because they don't seem to do too well. I mean, I have done infusoria cultures at 28 degrees and they do pretty good, but you don't want them at 30 degrees Celsius and you definitely don't want them too cool because they're gonna take a long time to develop. So I reckon that, you know, happy medium 22 to 26 degrees Celsius works very very well. That tip with the cyclops, I can't stress enough, you'll find cyclops on leaves of plants and I've definitely seen them all over my java moss and that's why I don't try and use java moss in that small jar. So if I could give you guys any advice, it's first of all to make sure you got none of these micro predators in your cultures and the second thing too is to make sure you have a large volume of water so in case there are some, which I guarantee there's some in my bucket 
bucket method of creating infi soya, I guarantee there's some in there. At least there's a huge volume of water in there and they're not gonna be able to hunt down all of those guys. So again, I've been very hesitant in making this video because there's so many opinions online on how to create infi soya and there's so many different methods. So what works for me might not work for you and I guess just take all of this information that I've given you with a grain of salt because a lot of people are gonna disagree with me on certain things and that's fine, but this is just what's worked for me. So I guess I'll catch up with you guys in about 48 hours once our other infusoria culture kit has matured, our quick infusoria kit with the yeast, and I'll show you guys exactly what that looks like and tell you guys how long it took to get to that stage. Okay, so about 36 hours later, I came back to our infusoria culture and I took it off the shelf to have a look to see if there was anything inside. And to my surprise, we'd already had some infusoria and it was actually quite a substantial amount. Now, given that this was only 36 hours, I'm pretty impressed with the amount of infusoria that was in here. However, if we let this culture mature and go clear, we would have had a ton more infusoria, but that's absolutely fine because the whole point of this method is to get infusoria quickly in case you just need it urgently for some sort of emergency fry case or something like that. So you can see here, all those little infusoria swimming around in the water and if you flash the torch around, you can really get a good look at them. So that's what you're looking for in your culture and this is definitely gonna be the easiest way to create infusoria really quick but that's pretty much gonna wrap this video up guys so thank you so much for watching it I really hope you guys enjoyed it I really appreciate you guys watching these videos and I'll see you in the next one